David, he, he believes that you're fixing to hit us tonight, he says. No, we are not fixing to hit you. That is not true. Nobody's coming in there. Okay. You got my word, it's solid. It's a okay. thousand percent absolute, okay? Okay. I know I know that everybody's skittish, but you know, we just gotta work on the kids. Yeah. Uh, wait. situation. If we do our part as his servants, the government does their part as whoever they are in the plan of God. What is it that God plans to bring out of it? That's the way they thought. We never went in. Uh, we did not introduce fire into this compound. It was not our intention that this compound be burned down. I, I can't tell you the shock and the horror that all of us felt when we saw those flames coming out there. It was, oh my God, they're killing themselves. I just hope everyone doesn't jump to making decisions with, before they've heard our side. Because right now all you're hearing is the press. You're hearing a very perverted press. Trust God, read your Bible, know what you're talking about. What are you doing with your life? What do you do every day with your life? Is it something God approves of? I mean, before you judge us, make sure your own life is clean. You know, I mean, we're, we're being stripped naked. We believe that this thing had to be brought to a logical conclusion at some point. We never fired one single round of ammunition. Were there rules of engagement by the FBI? What were they? Yes, they were, that they would not shoot unless someone's life was in danger. The joint hearings of the Oversight Subcommittee on Crime will now come to order. The uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, for five minutes. Thank the gentleman. In the fall of 1993, Treasury and Justice issued their respective reports about Waco. Treasury, in effect, said, well, ATF blew it. We were the bad guys. Justice, on the other hand, uh, exonerates the FBI. Well, folks, when I, read, when I got those two reports, I thought this is all too coincidental. One group conveniently assuming blame, the other group what walks, waltzing away with no blame. I think I this is the approach of what I call the lunatic fringe. Still clings to the notion that there was a gigantic governmental conspiracy that brought about this nightmare. It is difficult to see how any rational human being subscribe to, subscribes to such a notion, but obviously many do. Uh, what I am telling you is that the most plausible single explanation for this nightmare, namely the apocalyptic vision of a criminally insane charismatic cult leader who was hell-bent on bringing about this infernal nightmare in flames and the extermination of the children and the women and the other innocents is not an explanation that should be cast aside. Revelation states that Christ has the key of David, and only he can open and none can shut. And there's 150 Psalms here. Some people find it amazing that I know every one of them. Vernon Howell thinks he's the Lamb of God, when all he is is a cheap thug 
who interprets the Bible through the barrel of a gun. Now they're making self-serving statements that ATF opened fire. There was the an element an in the press conferences every day to uh, demonize David, and uh, con it was through the language, you know, cult leader David Koresh and compound and bunker, and militarize the situation so that nothing ever positive came out. There was never any sense of telling the public, uh, well, who are these people? I'm Paulina. I'm Stephen. I'm Vanessa. Well, you had a bunch of women, children, elderly people. They were all good, good people. They had different beliefs from others, uh, different beliefs than I have, or maybe different beliefs than you have in their way of life, and especially in their religious uh, beliefs. But basically, they were good people. I was around them quite a lot. They were always nice, mannerly. They minded their own business. They, they were never overbearing. They were always clean and courteous. I liked them. And what brings you all the way from England, a nice, lovely home of which I've seen and been in, what brings you to America, to a place called Waco, Texas, or Wac Waco, Waco, Texas? Anybody want to speak first? No. I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to know to understand the Bible. And I wanted to know about the seven seals. And I met somebody who can show me the seven seals. I have my pastors, my ministers. I was, I was a former Seventh-day Adventist. Nobody could show me. And now I've, I've found what I've been looking for. The home video shown throughout this film is the only record of the Davidians during the 51-day siege. It was made because the FBI gave them a camera and asked them to talk about themselves. We're going to be just fine because God's in control. The FBI showed those tapes to no one, and in its report admits that it did not do that because it thought that those tapes would have won sympathy for Koresh. Of course, the public heard of David Koresh uh, in February of 93, but the history of the group goes back for about 50 years, long before David Koresh was uh, even born. The Branch Davidians are a break-off from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Advent meaning the second coming of Jesus. The Davidians, uh, starting with uh, a man by the name of Victor Hotep in the 1930s and 40s, believe that God had once again visited his people with a living prophet. That's the key. Victor Hodef claimed to be that living prophet and moved his followers to Waco, Texas from Southern California during the 1930s. Living outside town in cottages, the Davidians studied the Bible as literal truth. The book of Revelation and its cryptic seven seals was their focus. Christians generally believe the seals tell God's planned sequence of events leading to Judgment Day and that their true meaning can only be explained by the Lamb of God, a Messiah who will come during the last days. Five years after Hodef's death in 1954, all Davidians gathered at Mount Carmel. They believed Armageddon, the Bible's predicted final battle between good and evil, was close. We feel that world conditions uh, are such, in the line with prophecy, that uh, all nations are soon to gather against Jerusalem to battle. In fact, we expect that to be this spring. The Davidian church almost disappeared after that. But Ben and Lois Roden kept a small group together. Lois led the Davidians after her husband died. And it was she who tutored young Vernon Howell as her understudy. When Lois Roden died, a leadership conflict between Howell and her son George, dubbed the Mad Man of Waco, split the Davidians. It's a holy jihad. There, uh, it's uh, what you have with Khomeini against Israel. You've got a, a Vernon Howell against me. The majority backed Howell. When George chased them off at gunpoint, 
Howell and his followers moved to Palestine, Texas, where they lived together in buses and tents. After an armed confrontation between the two rivals, Vernon Howell became the new Davidian leader. George Roden was later convicted of murder in an unrelated matter. During a pilgrimage to Israel, Howell believed God chose him to be a contemporary Cyrus and free God's chosen people, just as the ancient Persian king Cyrus had defeated the Babylonians and freed the captive Jews. On returning to the United States, he legally changed his first name to David, honoring the Hebrew king David, and his last name to Koresh, after the Messiah Koresh mentioned in the book of Isaiah. Koresh is the Hebrew word for Cyrus. What he essentially claimed was not to be God or not to be Jesus Christ. The Davidians believe that Jesus Christ is in heaven and they are Christian in the broad sense. But he claimed to be a final Christ figure, an anointed one. The word Christ really doesn't refer just to Jesus, but it means somebody that's chosen or sent or anointed. He claimed to be that final one that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, the seventh messenger, the final messenger that's to come. And he also found himself prophesied in throughout the Hebrew scriptures, but particularly the book of Isaiah and many of the Psalms in very detailed ways. And he would go through the scriptures and find the references to a sinful Messiah. And he says, my sins are more than the hairs of my head. Who could this be? Oh, this time when Christ reveals himself, it's gonna be according to the book. Because there's some statements in there that might make you a little bit happy. Okay? Such as the rest of Psalms 40. Lord, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. What's he going to preach? Seven seals. Seven seals. In fact, the sinful Messiah phrase got picked up by the Waco Tribune Herald and, and pushed in the wrong direction. The claim of Koresh and his followers was not go out and deliberately sin, but unlike Christ, this one will not be without sin. He'll be an ordinary human being who does sin. Attracted by Koresh's biblical teachings, new members increased the Davidians' numbers. In 1991, they recycled the lumber from the cottages and built the communal church that became familiar during the siege. As a multiracial congregation of all ages from around the world, residents contributed both their labor and money earned by work around Waco to support the spiritual life of Mount Carmel. Do you believe that Koresh was the Messiah? I think he was a Messiah. The allegations of child abuse and instances of violence in the past are, are generally, are these things generally consistent with, with the religious groups that you've studied? The pattern of allegations is a very familiar one. I mean, the way people described what was going on inside convents uh, sounds an awful lot like what we hear people describing going on inside the Branch Davidians, or what people thought, uh, as was referred to earlier, about what was going on with the Mormons in their early history. Uh, I think it's very important for us both to take those allegations seriously in the sense of actually investigating them, but also to realize that there is this predictable pattern once a group has decided that they want to live very differently and see the rest of us as wrong, that we're also likely to respond with a variety of kinds of fears and expectations and exaggerations. The two things about the group that I guess created the most sensation would be the uh, reported sexual irregularities, polygamy and so forth, uh, you know, underage women marrying David, and uh, the arms. It makes nobody's business whether we have a gun or not at this place. Guns are the right of Americans to have. Our government's the greatest in the world. We have freedom, not freedom for religion, not freedom for state, but freedom for all, you see? And that's what a lot of people don't understand. What he usually quoted is a scripture from Jesus on the night of his arrest where Jesus did not resist. Jesus says, uh, 
From now on, from now on, let him who has no sword buy one. Did King David have swords? Did Jesus tell the apostles to carry a sword with you? Yes. In other words, say, get ready for the future. This is for the little children, right? God knows how it should be. Stars and stripes are flying. Give us justice and liberty for the children's sake. You know, you might have to bear a gun one day. Now, how does that translate into, say, the communal living, even the sexual arrangements of the group? It's still textually based. At the time of the end, those who have wives should live as though they have none. That's a teaching in the New Testament, and it explains uh, the whole Catholic teaching on celibacy. You see this here? Hey, this is my family. It may not be like your family. Now, David Koresh himself obviously is not living the celibate life. The family that you just showed that is yours. Is that family mentioned in the scriptures? Anything to do with the seven seals? Steve, you answer that. <laughs> Y'all answer that. I mean, did I just, is my great, wonderful looks something that just women can't resist? <clears throat> huh? It has everything to do with the seals. It has everything to do with the seals, you know? Despite all the sneers and snickers that that would cause on the part of the public, what they believed is that although celibacy is the way for the group, that this figure, this final figure, has the obligation to beget 24 children, and he has multiple wives. It's in prophecy, in other words. Might have been convenient, but this is what they found. A lot of beliefs people have may seem abnormal or strange to other people, but that doesn't mean that it's not right, though. And these 24 children, are to become the 24 elders that are to rule the earth. And they found these various prophecies. He would have claimed and did claim that this was nothing to do with sensuality or sexual desire. Uh, essentially, it was for procreation. And he believed that these children, through these selected wives, would be pure. And like no children ever born, they're the beginning of the new Eden. You know, our children know how to respect, they know how to be mindful, they know how to do right, because they see it here. They see it in the parents, we subject ourselves to God, we're obedient unto God, we follow the pattern of, that God would have us to do. They would be raised completely in the community. They would have never eaten the, even the diet of the world, the defiled world out there, never watched TV, never participated in all the things that he saw as a corruption of the culture. That's how they would explain it. I think that all you who got kids in the supermarkets who run and scream and who eat all this junk food all the time and all this candy, I, I think if you look at the children, you'll see the actual product of the parent. After the Waco disaster, Alan Stone, a Harvard professor of both law and psychiatry, was asked to serve on a United States Department of Justice panel examining law enforcement policy toward unconventional groups like the Branch Davidians and leaders like David Koresh. I, I think Koresh was not a criminal psychopathic type. He had, as a, a youngster, spent months memorizing the Bible and particularly these particular passages about the seven seals. And that sort of repetitive study, memorization, a throwing yourself into that kind of disciplined project is not what sociopaths do. And he was able to convince the other people by his knowledge of the Bible and the way he put it together. That's how he convinced people like Mr. Martin and Mr. Schneider who were both intelligent, serious people. Mr. Martin was a graduate of Harvard Law School. He was one of our earliest African-American graduates. 
Uh, he was certainly not a weirdo. He was certainly not a criminal. He was certainly not a psychopath. He had gone on and done further religious studies after leaving Harvard Law School and had become interested in Koresh's teachings. That is how he got into the compound. So the idea that these people like Snyder and, and Martin were somehow criminal types or people who had just been sort of buffaloed by Koresh, I think, is a most unfortunate mischaracterization of in contrast to somebody, though, like Jim Jones of the Jonestown disaster. You must die with some dignity. All the is taking a drink to go to sleep. Koresh did not really exercise this uh, stunning, spellbinding, mesmerizing, stare-you-down sort of approach. Nobody, you talk to the Davidians uh, that have survived, none of them come out talking about, oh, Boy, when David spoke, I just felt like, you know, it was God. That isn't how they talk. They don't even have that sort of pious feeling about it. Why do the heathen rage? What's their problem? And the people imagine a vain thing. What are they thinking? Their thoughts are make-believe. Well, it's a vanity. Their thoughts are vain. I mean nothing to myself. I want to know what truth is. <laughs> And I'm searching for it. If he happens to be the vehicle that shows me, I thank God for it. I think he's great. <laughs> is he the son of God? I hope he is. Could you kind of describe for us how your findings differ from the rest of the reports uh, who are the reporters who have covered this story? First of all, I want to say thanks for reading my book. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Always glad it's to my meet job. someone who does. Uh, the biggest surprise I encountered in writing this book is that I had no competitors. And naturally, my conclusions differ or my questions differ because I learned a lot more than they did because they abandoned the story when the building burned down. Now, of course, there were some who didn't abandon it quite as quickly as others, but in general, this represents a major, major failure of the press in our country. One of the prophecies that had been around Mount Carmel since 1934 called for an ultimate confrontation between God's people, or those at Mount Carmel, and the forces of an armed apostate power called Babylon. Perhaps with that in mind, in 1991, he began studying armaments and buying and selling guns. He pretty quickly found out there's a lot of money to be made at gun shows, and he and other people started going to gun shows. And they bought and sold. We now say, or the press now says, and most people say, they stockpile weapons. All gun dealers stockpile weapons. All gun shops stockpile weapons. We call those stockpiles an inventory. How can one use firearms as an investment? The guns that he was buying would go up in value, no, no question. Okay. And do, do you know other people who do that? Yes, sir. It's not uncommon by no, itself, sir. is it? No, not by far. There was obviously, you know, firearms that were there, and there were a lot of uh, individuals that had their own firearms and there were you know quite an amount of firearms uh, but being in Texas you know we had people come from the community out to our property and shoot with us on our firing range and it was not really a big deal you know I went to a couple gun shows before I'm not an enthusiast at all to say the least but I went to a couple gun shows I met some people and you know some of our neighbors I, I would talk to had themselves they had like 10 and 12 guns just in their little family you know so it's, I just kind of call it the good old boy syndrome, the good old boy, uh, you know, kind of mentality down in Texas. And it's, it's a constitutional right. It's not, you know, evil or demonized. Did you state in your book at page 122 that you thought that the ATF was seeking to enforce unconstitutional firearms laws? I found a scholar 
who studied the constitutional history of firearms laws and whose opinion is that they may not be constitutional. I was quite impressed to find out that that argument could be made and thought readers deserved a chance to, to see it. Uh -huh. Well, now that you've studied it and written and promoted it, what do you think now? Whether or not they're constitutional? Aren't you worried about that? Yeah, whether they're constitutional. If the findings of these professors are trustworthy, that is a question to be litigated in the courts. I, I understand. I mean, it's nice to write a book about what may or may not be constitutional and unconstitutional, but yet when you come here to testify, well, there's no question now that you've thought about it, uh, th this is not so unconstitutional as, as you would have thought. I now, just a moment. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Mr. Ask Chairman, I think it is incumbent upon all of us to extend to courtesy to these witnesses, and I don't see what harm would, would result or ensue okay. if the gentleman were allowed to explain perhaps a response he didn't get a chance to do. I think we have to distinguish between illegality and constitutionality. Whether or not the arms laws are constitutional will be. At this point, the courts say they are. Tomorrow they may say different because of the research I cite in my book. At this time, I believe that all of you have some testimony in front of you from Carrie Jewell. Carrie, welcome and thank you for being here. You can begin. When Mom and Lisa and I went to Texas for Passover in 1991, David preached to us. I sat on the floor playing with his shoelaces while he talked. My mom and Lisa went to do a little shopping. I took a shower and then I was brushing my hair, sitting in the chair, and David took me, told me to come and sit down by him in the bed. I was wearing a long white t-shirt and panties. He kissed me and sat there, but okay. then he laid uh, me down. Gentlemen, he took his penis and I, rubbed I've been outside, very, very critical of the presentation earlier in this hearing of the victimization of Kerry Jewell, because as serious as child rape is, of course, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was conducting a firearms law investigation and search, and uh, the issue of Mr. Koresh's depravity is not what they were investigating or going to serve a search warrant for. And I think that that testimony was put into this hearing to take newspaper headlines and other media attention away from a lot of the testimony about the law enforcement participation in the raid. I'd like to just introduce the uh, biographies of the panel. Dick Guerin is a widely recognized defense attorney in the state of Texas. He represented David Koresh and entered the compound during the siege. Would like to also introduce Mr. Jack Zimmerman, also a well-known and respected attorney. He represented Steve Snyder. He also gathered first-hand evidence upon entering the compound during the siege. In addition to being a defense attorney, Mr. Zimmerman is a colonel in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. He practices as a military judge. Two very credible witnesses, welcome. You are saying, uh, Mr. Guerin, I saw in David Koresh not a person who was insane, a person who was deeply committed and sincere about his religious beliefs. Well, I am sorry for you if that's what you see in him. This was not a bunch of people who'd had uh, who'd been hypnotized. These people that I saw, and I met almost everybody in there that died in that fire, these people believed. They believed in the Bible. Some people had been there as long as 40 years. Some people had been born and raised there. They were there because they believed in a, uh, a vision of the Bible that was unusual. I don't understand it. I, and, uh, and, and these scholars have a difficult time understanding it, but it was real. You can't legislate away that. In fact, the First Amendment says that we can't do anything about that. Do you doubt the testimony of Kerry Jewell, who yes. was here? Did you hear about that? Yes, I do. Yes. You doubt that? Yes. Do you doubt that, Mr. Yes, Zimmerman? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you, do you know why? Yeah, you can tell me why. That, that, we didn't learn of that the first time when that she testified for this hearing. She, she's made... Uh, that, that kind of claim has been made for some time. Her own mother didn't believe that. Her own grandmother didn't believe that. Right. Uh, there's been uh, doubts about prior con contradictory statements that she's made in the past. Now, it may be 100% okay. true. Just it may be 100% true. Just my time because my time is okay. up. 
in my judgment, in many ways, these witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact about David Koresh. And I'd like we worked on that for a couple of years. In fact, we had the Department of Human Services go out and, and interview some of the kids and, and whatever they could do. I had people go out with them to interview. To this day, we don't have a case that we can make against Vernon Howell or anyone for child abuse. Uh, even though the news media here and other people kept saying this is what happened, a man from Australia said this is what happened. But we could never get them to give us anything more than just we know that's what happened. You have to have proof to go into court. Keep in mind, too, that most of the girls who were involved were, were uh, at least 14 years old, and 14-year-olds get married with parental consent. So if their parents were there and letting them uh, letting things happen in the way of sexual activities and what have you with their 14-year-old kids, you have common law husbands and wives. Uh, I don't say that I agree with that and that I approve of it, but at the same time, if parents are there and they're giving parental consent, we have a problem with that and making a case. My investigations convinced me that David Koresh was guilty of statutory rape. But I don't understand why two-thirds of the search warrant is about child abuse and statutory rape when the ATF has no jurisdiction over those offenses. We determined that at the compound, machine guns were being manufactured and explosive devices. Our goal through this investigation was to execute a search warrant on that house to obtain those illegal weapons. In addition, it had reason to believe uh, that uh, Koresh and his followers might pose a danger not only to themselves but, but to the surrounding community. I think in the case of the Davidians, if people had listened carefully to their rhetoric with an ear toward an understanding of religious apocalyptic language, would probably not have been worried about them using these weapons uh, against their neighbors. In a word, what the search warrant found was gun parts. It was the duty of the ATF to show that those gun parts were owned with an intent to create illegal weapons. I'm not a lawyer or a judge, but my reading of the warrant does not convince me that that intent was there. Do you say it's not been proven that there were 48 illegal machine guns and a bunch of illegal hand grenades on his compound? I believe there were 48 illegal uh, automatic weapons on April the 19th. I don't that's know correct. that that's the case on February 28th, sir. I see, but there were weapons there. Yes. How about hand grenades? Was there testimony about that? I, or were they just... I don't know. I don't recall that. Do you recall, Mr. DeGarren? No, I don't know any... Even though you know every other detail about the trial. That's not fair, Mr. Schumer. Do you doubt that there were 48 illegal weapons and I've hand grenades I've never said there? I knew all the details of the trial. Do you I've doubt that? I'm asking that you that peaceful. right now, sir. What is your question? My question is, do you doubt, do you have doubts that Mr. Koresh had on his compound illegal weapons and illegal hand grenades? No, do you have any doubts about that? No, he told Thank me you. he had illegal okay. weapons do you there. Have he doubts did not th tell me that he had hand grenades there. I see. And I okay. saw no hand, hand grenades. I did see some grenades that the ATF had thrown in, and I brought one out. What do you mean the, thrown in? The ATF threw in grenades in their dynamic entry. No, they didn't throw entry, any Mr. grenades in, as I yes, understand they did. it. They I were brought flash, one out. They were flash packs. They did Have not Have you ever explode. seen what a flash bang can do to somebody? It's a grenade. It has an explosive charge in it. It's very dangerous. It can blow your hand off. It can blow your face off. It can kill. I would have brought out some of the unexpended grenades that the ATF threw in but I was worried about bringing out a live grenade, so I left them there. There were a number of grenades. Okay, Mr. Daguerre, and I think that would hamper your credibility because you're the first person who would say that those were grenades. I've never really sat through a hearing the way the likes of yesterday. Six and a half hours of defense lawyers, their marathons, their ways of sliding over the truth was very unfortunate. This idea of the FBI having hand grenades, not flashbangs, but hand grenades. And finally, coup de grace, Mr. DeGuerin said flashbangers can kill, injure, maim. Anyone who knows anything about these things knows they can't. Mr. Cavanaugh, I have in my hand here a amount of Play-Doh. Uh, Mr. Bush, if you could, this is just, just standard Play-Doh. If that were 
a flashbang grenade or a stun grenade, the same thing, uh, which uh, was live, which pin had been pulled. Would you feel comfortable just holding that in your hand? <clears throat> well, Mr. Barr, a flashbang grenade, my answer is no. I would not want to hold it. Those are uh, classified as destructive devices under uh, uh, 26 U.S.C. Section 5845F, aren't they? Yes, sir, they are. Uh, that they can kill people. Is that true? Certainly, yes, sir. Well, uh, a uh, gentleman by the name of Warren L. Parker, an explosives enforcement officer, Bureau of ATF, on May 11, 1994, in court, uh, said under oath that they are designed to help kill the suspect while not endangering the law enforcement officer when they're used for those purposes. I'd like to focus on the search warrant. First, it was put together, as a number of witnesses have testified, in a prejudicial and inflammatory manner. And second, it clearly misstates the U.S. Code statute number for the offense charged, and I think makes other technical mistakes in the law, which means to me it was put together in a sloppy fashion. Now, you put together inflammatory with sloppy, that translates to me that, that ATF was in a hurry to make a big splash with something. Why was a warrant sought in the first place since David Korosh, on learning that he was being investigated by ATF, invited the agency on July 30th, 1992, through his gun dealer, Henry McMahon, to come to his residence and inspect his firearms? And I go, I got David Koresh on the phone. And David Aguilera, he goes, he jumps up and goes, don't call, don't call. And I go, I, I, I got him on the phone. And he goes, they never once followed up on that offer, never even tried to follow up on that offer. I, I can't imagine any circumstances uh, that I would not take up such an offer. Perhaps what the ATF thought were violations of the law were really things that Mr. Koresh thought were legal. Suggest perhaps said, that what they really wanted to do was to conduct a raid, not make an arrest or conduct a search. In the opinion of the agents, this, uh, uh, the planning for Waco and the, the manner in which it was done was done for the purpose of uh, publicity. Mr. Hartnett, uh, there's a rumor, and surely it's unfounded, that the publicity person or public relations person for ATF had released uh, some kind of a press uh, communication the night before to uh, media around the country that something big was going to come down in Texas. Yes, and we heard that, and she called um, called a reporter to ask if he was going to be in. Why These, did she do that? She wanted to be able to get a hold of them if there was a story and they recovered these arms. Wouldn't it be ample time after they were recovered? Oh, yes. I mean... What happened is that I contacted Channel 8 and Channel 5 in Dallas. I just said we might have something going on here in Dallas this weekend and I'd like... Uh, to have a weekend contact number, and that's what I was given. What was the purpose of contacting them? Were you actually seeking publicity for the agency? Absolutely not, sir. Okay, maybe then I don't understand the purpose for contacting them. With its appropriations hearings a week away, a large successful raid would produce major positive headlines to counter the ATF's reputation as a rogue agency whose debacles blackened the reputation of other agencies and it would scare the public enough about fringe groups to create political pressure on Congress to increase its budget. At least part of the ATF motivation, even if it never rose to the surface of discussion, was uh, to enforce the morals of our society, to enforce the, uh, the psyche of, of right thinking by retaliating against these odd people. Let me just ask uh, Mr. Moulton, was there a cover-up? Absolutely not. Not by the Treasury Department in the preparation of that report, absolutely not. Do you agree with that comment? No, I don't. Why? I feel that the Treasury Department has said things since the time of um, uh, the raid at Waco that, that have been incorrect. It also had many omissions, distortions, and uh, false statements in it. And why do you believe those omissions and false statements are in that report? I believe that they were concerned about the, the fallout from the media. Were these agents knowingly outgunned before they started? We weren't outgunned at Waco, that's for sure. Almost 100 agents spent three days in dress rehearsals at Fort Hood, Texas, all at U.S. Army expense. In order for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, to have obtained the military assistance they did receive, 
not because of the Posse Comitatus Act, but because of existing military policy. They misrepresented to the military that this was an anti-drug raid when it was never an anti-drug raid. Unfortunately, there are many people who still, when they speak to me about Waco, say, well, those people were involved in drugs. And there's no evidence that Koresh was or that any of these people were. As practicing lawyers, we know that usually judges rubber stamp the applications for search warrant. The Fourth Amendment guarantees the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Ironically, a charred copy of the very amendment was found in the debris at Waco. There's the charred copy that was found right there at Waco. The morning of February 28th, ATF and Texas Department of Public Safety officers blocked the roads leading to Mount Carmel Center. Several miles away, the raid team was busy suiting up, fully expecting to surprise the Davidians. Sharon Wheeler had ample videotape for the many cameras that agency officials thought would record a major publicity coup. Most of the 130 men, women and children inside Mount Carmel learned about the raid only minutes before it happened. The news people were out there 30 minutes before the raid. That's how supposedly they were tipped off by a news person. About the time I got there, David came in from the other side, different side of the room, and um, came in and said that they'd heard that somebody was coming, and uh, he wanted everybody to remain calm and go back to their rooms and just stay cool. He would go down the front door and talk to them. You're with Koresh, correct? Uh, he gets very nervous. Uh, did you request that the raid be called off because the element of surprise had been lost? Yes, sir. I, I arrived at the command post, and the first, thing, the first thing I asked was, where's Chuck? Where's Chuck? And they advised me that he had left. At that time, I started yelling, and, and I said, why? Why? They know we're coming. They know we're coming. I did not feel he knew that we were coming at that time. When I talked with Robert, like I testified before, I took notes while we were talking over the thing, and I've read all of Robert's statements. Robert did a did a great job, but I think everything that you heard Fire's testimony was not passed on to me. Those two men know, know what I told them, and they knew exactly what I meant. And, and instead of coming up and, and admitting to the American people right after the raid that they had made a mistake, that the element of surprise had been lost, that the agent had advised them that they knew they were coming, instead of doing that, they lied to the public and in doing so, it just about destroyed a very great agency. The helicopters were to arrive first at the rear of Mount Carmel and divert the Davidians' attention from the ATF agents moving in on the ground from the front. Approximately 9.15, we saw three helicopters, two small ones and a, and a large one. And we sat there and watched them. They were making big loops behind the compound just sort of circling, not the compound, but behind it. And I got the camera out and proceeded to shoot the helicopters flying around. So I've got three of them. We put the camera back in, we look up, and a cattle trailer goes by. It's a chuck full of uh, ATF agents. And we're sitting there, and about two, three, four seconds later, another cattle trailer goes by. I saw a truck come in, a very long truck in the front, then this long thing. The um, second truck stopped and barely stopped, and the man, a man jumped out in, in all kind of whatever gear it was he had on, and he had a gun in his hand. He says, okay, boys. Then I heard a voice to the right of me downstairs. I could tell it was at the door. Then I heard a voice on the outside. Then I heard another voice inside, and then I heard shots outside. And when we drove up, the Davidians opened fire. And 
I am sickened by any other assertion. I sat there and I watched it. And the gunfire came through those double white doors. I watched it. It's unbelievable, but that's what happened. And anybody else who says anything different, they shot first. And if I thought that an ATF agent would drive up in front of a structure and shoot, I'd throw my badge in the garbage. It didn't happen. If the Branch Davidians intended to ambush those people with 48 machine guns and 50 caliber machine guns, and they came up in unprotected cattle cars with nothing but tarps on them, they would have blown them away. So that convinced us that they did not that is, the Davidians did not fire first. I sat by that door for several hours. I went in and out of that door 10 times, and I saw the bullet holes on the door on the right side. Almost every bullet hole was an incoming round. And what I mean by that, it's a metal door. You could easily tell that the bullets were incoming rounds. They were punched in. I'm not the, the marine expert that Jack Zimmerman is, but I've been hunting since I was 10 years old, and I know a bullet hole when I see it. And those were bullet holes that were punched in. Of course the majority of bullet holes would yes. be through, would be going in that direction because the Davidians are not going to keep the door closed and shoot through it. What you need to find is the videotape that was made of the raid. It disappeared. What you need to get is the photographs of the front uh, that are similar to the one that's being displayed right now. Now, you have the power to get that evidence, and you ought to get it. That is not fair. That is not a proceeding that is right. If we want to go over the issue of who fired first, then that's, we should... Wait a second. I'd like to finish my point. point. That's not a point of uh, order. It is a point of it order. It is not a point of we order. You are Mr. out of Zimmerman. order. I will just make one comment to the witnesses uh, relative to uh, the videotape in the front door. We have re uh, consistently asked as a committee to get a copy of a videotape, which they now say is blank. We have asked for the door, and the door is missing. The first cattle trailer had already pulled up. The second one was pulling up when we got about halfway down the driveway, and all hell broke loose. Okay, All this is happening while they're supposed to serve a knock search warrant. You know, they knock on the door and serve the warrant. And you have one group of ATF agents who goes to the front of the building. And there's a, a very large, penned up area that we had for uh, Fawn, uh, an Alaskan Malamute, and her four pups that were living there. And they shot them in cold blood, first thing. This was an unreasonable search done in an unreasonable manner with excessive force. And the law is clear. Even an arrest by lawfully constituted officers can be resisted if before anything else happens, those officers use excessive force. They of a couple of agents or a couple of detectives walking up to somebody's front door or knocking on a door in three-piece suits to execute a warrant of any kind is over. And that's where we stand. We stand between the Koreshes of the world and everybody here. We stand. Law enforcement. First 15, 20 minutes, 
it was get the job done, shoot the video. And then when you see people getting shot, and you can hear people screaming and the bullets hitting. I have two daughters, and I started thinking about my daughters. And at that point, I wondered, you know, how the heck am I going to get out of here? Somebody said to me, Winston Blake is dead. I said, where is he at? And they said, he's up in his room. So as I'm approaching uh, Winston's room, I could hear water running, and I couldn't figure it out. You know, what, what would that be? You know, but as I turned into his doorway, um, Winston's lying on the floor beside his bed, and a pool of blood and water. And there's water pouring into the room from just dozens of bullet holes in the water tank that was right outside his window. And the window was all shattered and everything. I figured that, judging from the angle of the bullets coming down from the outside and into the room, that uh, it had to be from helicopter. There's no buildings, tall buildings out the back. Uh, anybody on the ground couldn't have shot at that angle into the water tanks. The Davidians shot back. The helicopter landing in the foreground has been forced down by multiple hits. 17-year-old Peter Gent was inside the silo scraping rust when the raid began. Gent is barely visible in this news video as he climbed to the top to see what was going on. The video apparently shows him being shot from this passing helicopter. Gent falters and then drops back onto the silo's roof. Federal officials didn't let the Davidians remove his body for five days. Like, I don't, I'm not exactly sure it happened so fast, but at any rate, it, it went up this finger into my hand and out my shoulder. Hey, Winston. Hey. Ambulance. Ambulance. Got it. We're sitting there, and the uh, ATF agent says, newsman, newsman, call an ambulance. We need an ambulance. John got back into the car, and just as he was reaching the car, he opened the door and a bullet went through the door jam and he dove into the car. And we had to physically make the phone call. And this is, from my understanding, the first time that an ambulance had been called. And this was well under the gun, gun battle. For some reason, they didn't have any communications. Why would we have to call for an ambulance? Nobody was going to get us out. The McLennan County Sheriff's Office, who always did a good job in this case, could not get us out of this. We couldn't call 911. I mean, we couldn't call anybody. Well, it just seems interesting to me that they didn't even have uh, telephones or communications to get that 911 communication back and forth that Wayne Martin had from inside the compound for 20 minutes trying to stop the shooting. Uh, but at the same time, they had fax machines, telephones, and computers, and were ready for whatever PR they had, that that was a mighty, mighty strange operation, to say the least, and certainly a fatal flaw, not to pun a word. Mr. Hartnett, was there a raid plan? We had pieces of it, if you know what I mean, that they hadn't brought it together. It was right in the middle of an order going out to the field, giving them sp specific instructions on how to written raid plan, how to bring it together and forward it forward. Well, it was out for coordination at the time. Now, uh, what I received was written, but very, very abbreviated. In your review, did ATF, and they're participating in this close combat support, did they have go, no-go procedures? Yes, sir, but uh, of, of a very, I'm looking for the appropriate words. Uh, I'll just call them unsophisticated variety. An unsophisticated variety. That's a very tactful you're being very tactful today. In your report, you, didn't, you weren't as tactful because you said their lack of contingency plan 
basically was, quote, an oh shit plan. Isn't that basically what you that, Those were that the words like, that I'm were given run to from us. the building, yes, take cover. Oh, shit, it's coming. Uh, uh, they were throwing everything at us, and their guns sound like cannons, and our guns sound like pop guns. We had 9 millimeters. They were hitting us with 223, AK-47s, 50 calibers. But it was more than you can imagine. After about approximately two hours, we heard that there was a truce. We heard ATF agents say, don't shoot, don't shoot. The agents were out of ammunition. They could have killed nearly every ATF agent out there the day of the raid had they kept shooting. But when they said they would leave their property, they quit shooting them. You gotta argue with me, you come and argue with me. You come point guns in the, in the direction of my wives and my kids, damn it, I'll, I'll meet you at the door any time. And I'm sorry some of you guys got shot, but uh, hey, God will have to sort that out, won't he? The chair recognizes Mrs. Taylor from Mississippi. Do you have any combat experience? 26 months, sir. Commanded two artillery batteries in Vietnam. In Vietnam? Yes, sir. Ms. Zimmerman, have you seen anything or heard anything that would lead you to believe or read anything that justifies the murder of those four ATF agents and the 20 more who were wounded by the Branch Davidians by David Koresh and his followers on the morning of February 28th? The jury in San Antonio found that the killings of the four agents were in self-defense. They were acquitted of murder, sir. Did you know that? They were acquitted of murder and acquitted of conspiracy to commit murder. Every single uh, defendant, all 11, were acquitted of murder. Oh. Are you going to tell me that every murderer in this country who's walked was really innocent? Well, you asked me, did we know of anything that would say that they weren't guilty of murder? And the answer is yes. If the ATF accidentally or however opened fire on people in their home and all they did was defend themselves in their home, then under the law, that's justifiable homicide. It's not murder. Is there any way that somebody could believe that justifiable homicide could be used as a defense here? No, Mr. Schumer. They shot through the doors. They shot through the ceilings. Assertions that we had helicopters or men from Mars shooting at them is nonsense. Our agents were laying on the ground, shooting at a tower three stories high. Should we be surprised there's bullets in the roof? Of course. I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Cameron. sorry. Thank you. You must understand that not one agent who was at the raid on the scene on the 28th made a written report of it. That's highly irregular. On March the 1st, the ATF initiates a shooting review. Johnston, the assistant United States attorney, advised Hartnett to stop the ATF shooting review because ATF was creating Brady material. Brady material, ladies and gentlemen, is information that might tend to show that someone accused is innocent. Some, they tried to explain this to say, well, uh, that just meant, you know, we, have, we don't want to, what, compromise the prosecution. You don't want to compromise the prosecution by revealing evidence that might tend to show that somebody is not guilty of the charges? Well, that's not where we are in this country, I hope. That's just one agency. All the other agencies back there are going to back them up. That's including our federal government. We, the people, don't run this government anymore. They do, and they tell all the lies they want.
those that are trying to do their best are trying to do their job. They have a family back home too, but they don't understand what the system is doing. If they did, they would speak out against it. Shortly after the wounded arrived, armed guards stood sentry at the hospital entrances. ATF agents comforted each other as they found out the toll taken in this raid. Fifteen agents were brought to Hillcrest Baptist Medical Center. Three of them died, including one agent who was shot in the head. Some Davidian mothers sent their children out of Mount Carmel. As they were delivered to a rendezvous point, news reports said three Davidians tried to escape by shooting their way past ATF agents. The story was false. Sunday, my husband was killed by ATF agents. I want everyone to know that that was totally against. He was just coming home to his family. He didn't kill anybody. Investigators in a military helicopter discovered the body approximately 350 yards from the Colt compound. He was the victim of gunshot wounds on it, and, and basically that's, that's all I can say about that right now. On the phone front, Jim Cavanaugh was trying to get David Koresh to trust him. Well, I think we need to, uh, you know, set the record straight, and that is that there was no guns on those helicopters. There was National Guard officers on those helicopters. There was no guns on those helicopters. That's a lie. That is a lie. He's a damn liar. Did you hear that? I know what he said, but it's it's, it's not true. He, says, he wants to talk to you now. Okay. Now, Jim, you're a damn liar now. Let's get real. David? You're, no, you listen to me. You're sitting there and telling me that there were no guns on that helicopter? I said they didn't shoot. There's no guns You shot. are a damn liar. Oh, you're wrong, David. You are a liar. Okay. Well, just calm down. And, you know, let me tell you something. That may be what you might want the media to believe. But there's other people that fall, too. Now, tell me, Jim, again. You're honestly going to say those helicopters didn't fire? On any of us? David? 
I'm here. Yeah, what I'm saying is that those helicopters did not have mounted guns, okay? I'm not disputing the fact that there might have been uh, fire from the helicopters. What I'm telling you is there was no mounted guns, you know, outside mounted guns on those helicopters. I agree with you on oh, that. All right, and that's, that's the only thing I'm saying. Now, the agents on the helicopters had guns. I agree with you okay. on that. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Well, no. What the dispute was over, I believe, Jim, is that you said that they didn't fire on us from the helicopter. Well, what I mean is a mounted gun. Yeah, but beside the point, what they did have was machine guns. Okay. I don't. I don't know what they had. They were armed. The people inside had pistols or we agree rifles. Then. Okay. All right. That's good. That's good. We agree. Okay. Let's just leave it at that. On March 1st, the BATF handed control to the FBI. My name is Dan Hartnett, the Deputy Director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. I'm going to make a brief statement. We're each are going to make a brief statement and then we'll open it up to questions. My name is Jeff Jamar. I'm the Special Agent in Charge of the FBI in, in the San Antonio Division. And I'm the Special Agent in Charge of FBI Operations here in Waco. It's J-A-M-A-R. First name's Jeff. We're here because David Koresh and his followers killed four ATF agents. We've responded with, with necessary personnel and equipment. The area is a crime scene. The goal is to resolve this situation, ultimately in federal court, with no further bloodshed. The FBI is getting involved now, but uh, it's kind of like... Uh, getting into a fight with a couple of next door neighbors where the you know the little brother comes over and whips you and then the big brother comes over to investigate <laughs> you know anyway we'll try to work this out we're prepared to do whatever it takes and stay here as long as it takes to settle this matter without any further bloodshed was there any reason The Davidians were completely surrounded. FBI snipers were placed in sandbag positions here and here. Their clear field of fire meant anyone trying to leave would easily be gunned down. Sierra One was the code name for the front half of Mount Carmel Center. It was the side news cameras saw through telescopic lenses a mile or two away. Sierra 2 was the back half of Mount Carmel. It was completely hidden from public view. It was the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms that caused this first disaster. Okay, so the FBI takes over. They're very sensible, reasonable. They decide we'll negotiate. They quickly realized that the negotiators were not in charge, and Koresh at one point says, look, all you guys are anyway are waitresses. You carry my my request back to the kitchen where the boss is. They say, look, I can't make the decisions. If I could, things would go better, but the decisions are being made 1,500 miles away in Washington, D.C. We made an agreement with the ATF agents that if they would allow me to have national coverage with this tape so that I might give to the world a small, minute, small, minute bit of the information that I have tried so hard to share with people. Can you say what God said to him? Can you give a little more details of exactly after 1.30, you're waiting for him, you finally make contact. What does he say? The question was, what did God say to, to Koresh? Um, he says that he did not fulfill his promise to leave immediately with his followers because God told him to wait. And Schneider says, and Koresh afterwards later says, look, we didn't lie. 
this is like you guys telling us you're not going to turn off the lights or one thing or another and getting overruled from above. We have our chain of command. You have your chain of command. He gave us his word that after the message was played... Yes, but what if there is a higher power than you and I that speaks to an individual? If there is a God in this universe, and there's the laws of man, and there's the laws of God, and this God that has led him all his life says to him to wait, what do you do? When the FBI said that five times Koresh promised to come out and didn't, Dr. Arnold, Dr. Tabor, and I sent a message to them. We said, show us the five times. We can't find them in the negotiation transcripts. We think they're making that up. We find no instance, those of us who've listened to the negotiation tapes and studied the transcripts, of Koresh line. On March the 2nd, he said he was coming out and then said God told him not to. If any lies were told, it was that, and we would have to know what God said to Koresh in order to call that a lie. Do you people believe that Koresh is actually talking to God? <laughs> Koresh believes he's talking to God. The FBI wasn't prepared to share David Koresh's contention that we should wait on God to resolve this. The FBI is God. It's going to decide how this is going to be resolved. Bringing these tanks and stuff around here, I tell you what, being an American first, I'm the kind of guy that I'll stand in front of a tank, you can run over me, but I'll be biting one of the tracks. No one's going to hurt me or my family. That's, 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 that's American policy here. Agent Pete Smerick, who was in charge of drawing up the psychological profile of Korish, counseled a cautious, non-confrontational approach with Korish in four memos written to senior FBI officials between March 3rd and March 8th. According to Mr. Smerick, FBI superiors pressured him to change his assessment to justify a more confrontational approach. They would do things like play sound tapes of rabbits being slaughtered or uh, uh, Nancy Sinatra singing songs. And, and then they would bring out lights at night. And uh, not, not that Nancy Sinatra always was that bad, but the ones that she had kept. The point was this. They were trying to have sleep disturbance and they were trying to take somebody that they viewed to be unstable to start with and then they were trying to drive him crazy and then they get mad because he does something that they think is irrational you keep playing where you should be playing and you keep thinking that you'll never get burned We have a couple of uh, Kansas City's finest members of the SWAT team. This one here is quite, a, quite a, a specimen. I tell you, I just in all my years involved with SWAT, I've never seen a gentleman like this that I've learned so much from in just the short time I've been around him. It's just awesome is about the only word to describe him. Honed, honed to a fine edge, honed to kill. That's that's right. He just <laughs> he just uh, Rambo. He's he's just like Rambo out here himself. Yes, right here. Well, Mr. Ricks, is there a consideration to use psychological warfare? Have you discussed it at all? I, I don't know what psychological warfare is. This, uh, it was reported in the paper that you would play loud music, um, keep bright lights on the compound all night to try to agitate the entire group. Is that a possibility? We, we, will, we will not discuss ta uh, tactics of that sort, but I would say the chances are minimal of doing that type of activity. Yes, ma'am. Day 7 finds reporters facing a banner reading, 
God help us, we want the press. Reporters respond with a statement of their own. God help us, we are the press. I was wondering, is there any way of getting some leaflets down to the media? Bill Latham drove from Dallas-Fort Worth to volunteer the services of the Ku Klux Klan. We're just tired. I mean, we've been watching up there in Fort Worth and Dallas, and we're just tired of uh, watching it drag on like this. I mean, either give them, give them an ultimatum, give them a deadline. When I first was asked to be involved as a member of the panel, I thought the main problem was going to be understanding the psychology of the people inside the compound. But as I got into it, I quickly became aware that the psychology of the people outside the compound was more important to an understanding of what happened. They were mooning the, the women, for instance. They would drop their pants and bend over and bare their rear end to, uh, to people that were looking out the windows, uh, which was, you know, not a situation that some of the women or even some of the men took too lightly in the sense, well, do we want to send our children out to these kind of people? Steve, every time we're aware of movement, we've told we're you about controlling it. these guys. I mean, if you got guys out there right now pulling their pants down, men Steve. that are mature, that are they're sticking their butts out in the air and flipping the finger. Give me, give me a moment. See, right. the guys that gravitate toward, uh, you know, riding in tanks, jumping out of airplanes and stuff like that are a little I different agree. mindset than I you and I. I agree with you. Right? I agree. So when they get a chance to use uh, a Bradley. Probably half of them have never been in a Bradley before. It reminded me of a lot of kids in there. Absolutely. An opportunity to hey, let's there. drive this baby and see how it works. Sure, but you know? somebody's got to be above these guys. Well, those vehicles and what they're doing do not show what is coming out of the uh, out of the mouths of some of you guys. Let me give you an example. Now that we brought this up, we had a burial for um, one of the people out front. Peter Gent was buried out front and the tanks ran over his grave over and over and over again just totally like it wasn't even there and they knew that's where we buried him and they just kept running over it and over it and we were disgusted with that we talked about that quite a bit I mean I thought this was the country of you know freedom of speech, freedom of religion, whatever and just human decency is this doesn't seem to exist they saw all this as working from a military point of view because the people inside the compound, the branch Davidians, weren't shooting back. So they saw themselves as winning the battle as they tightened. What they didn't realize was we we're driving them to the point of desperation. To my family and friends, I'd just like to say I'm fine. I know that you're all worried about us. I'd just like to know that we are fine right now. And uh, <clears throat> everything in the hands of God right now, and we're just waiting on God. Whatever happens, we know <clears throat> it's, it's the way that God wants it to be. If they thought that we were all brainwashed and, uh, and such a bunch of crazies, why would the FBI push David or the rest of us to the limit. Did they want to create an incident? Did they want us to come out, you know, crazy and start shooting so that they'd have an excuse to gun us down? We didn't know. We realize that you have the ability, and it's not uh, b below you people to do something like to erase all evidences. Why do you have the press so far back? You can give me any kind of crap you want. I know, you know, the reason we're not talking to the press is you people have got to cover your butts from what you did, and that's what's going on here. And at one point, the FBI asked them, do they have fire extinguishers? And Schneider sends someone to check and comes back with the report that there's only one fire extinguisher in the building. The FBI negotiator's response is, Somebody ought to buy some fire insurance. The question is, will we permit a pool camera up close? Any closer than you are. We did. We, we went down the road. We stopped at a place where you could still see the compound. That was not accidental. We made sure that you could still see the compound. We could have moved you where you don't have any sight. We didn't do that. And the reason we don't want a camera there is they watch television, and they watch us approach if we do anything. We're not, we're not going to assault the place. 
But anything we do around there to get control, that is precisely why you can't have a camera there. Okay? In Waco, where they're weary of the standoff, DJ JR is giving residents a lift by actually doing what the FBI only joked about. One person was rec recommending we play uh, Achy Bricky Heart continuously. It's like a big carnival, really, out here with all the t-shirts and stuff. You see that house over yonder? Do you? Allegations are flying that all of this may have been avoided two years ago. The FBI received complaints about the compound and did not pursue them aggressively. It's that matter and others that have caused several near fights, pushing and shoving, that sort of thing. The source says the FBI has isolated ATF. We're taking a back seat. Everyone in Mount Carmel was free to leave. Though theologically the situation is complex, yes, you're free to jump out of Noah's Ark and into the, onto the land that's fixing to be flooded, but everyone was free to leave. Some did. Anyone could have left, but theologically it was not a good idea. You were risking your soul if you left. What we saw of those that did come out were they were being sent um, to jail, the adults, even elderly women in their 70s were being uh, actually indicted for murder or, or charged. This was the nearly told that that's what happened when people came out. We, we saw it and heard it on the news. I see. There's been a number of people that have wanted to come in and be a negotiator between ourselves and you. I do believe it would be in the best interest of all if there was a news person in between yourselves and ourselves. We don't want to take anybody. Okay. But right now, it's, it, it seems like we're coming to a stalemate. You know, we're not getting anywhere. We, Who would you like to have here when you guys come out? Who would you like to invite no, no, here? No, 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 no. You're... You, boy, you've got rocks in your ears, Dick. Okay, explain to me. I'm sorry. You're, you're saying when we come out. I'm talking about right now. Let's get somebody in between us right now to do some negotiating. We have a woman who believes in her heart and soul that she can get her grandson to lay down his arms and come out. Well, I'm his grandmother, and he's my grandson. All my grandchildren are good kids, because I've taught them well. And so I approached and told them that I was there, and I'd like to speak to the agent in charge, and that I was a lawyer, and I had David Crash's grandmother with, with me, and I wanted to see about talking to him. And... Uh, after a few minutes, another one came up to me who was obviously the guy in charge and was very surly and uh, declined to give me any information at all. So I started to leave, and just as I left and turned my back and started walking toward my van, I heard a voice say, coming from one of those people, I don't know which one, but one of them said, I hope she has told him goodbye. That was the mentality of the people who were guarding the gates. Those were federal law enforcement authorities. And their attitude was, we are going to get revenge against David Koresh, and if that means we have to eliminate all of them in there, that's just fine, too. That was the attitude that they had. On a special live call-in show here this morning, listeners had strong opinions on how they think this tragedy should now be handled. A majority seemed to want law enforcement to end it all quickly. Good morning, Waco 100. I vote for going and just take him out. All right. Well, I do believe, and I think they ought to go in there and just get it over with because I think it's costing us a lot. What could have been done to get the Davidians out of that compound without bloodshed? 
we were on the way to doing that. On April the 14th, there was a major breakthrough, and that breakthrough was David Korsh's letter to me, which I promptly gave to the FBI, that said that he'd received his mission, that he was working on writing his interpretation of the seven seals, and that everyone inside was relieved that they didn't have to die now, that the prophecies were not being fulfilled now, and that this would be resolved. People don't understand how important that was. David Koresh and his people believed that God's message for our generation could not be written and should not be written. And David Koresh had never before written down his ideas. He believed that he had received a message from God saying, now, David, write. Before I told you not to, now I'm telling you you can. He waited 51 days, and then he said, the word came to him and said, write, and he wrote. This was brought out the day of the fire by one of the survivors. He was keeping his promise of April 14th. We believe they would have all come out safely. Um, this this was pulled out of the fire, uh, the, the tapes were, and then then this this then was written up um, as evidence that he was working on that message on the seven seals. All they had to do was say, we've got a disk, we're going to be sending it out. When the FBI advised me of their plan and the possibility of the insertion of gas, I did notify the White House counsel and kept in contact through the White House counsel. I am sure the White House counsel advised the president. We're missing some of your telephone logs, particularly April uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and our problem is, is that they've all been redacted. Um, and, and is there any chance that we could get those? I can't be helpful. You've, nobody's ever asked me, but I have a copy of these same logs, and you're welcome to them as far as I'm concerned, uh, except I, I have to tell you the 17th and 18th were and Saturday and Sunday, and so therefore there wouldn't be any these are basically logs of people who called and left a message for me to call them back. Not, not necessarily everybody I talked Primarily. to. What I was faced with was a situation where the negotiators said, we think we have reached an impasse. Nobody else is coming out voluntarily. We looked at the entire situation and we made the best judgment we could. I'm very satisfied that in the information furnished to me by the FBI, I was informed. Do you know if Attorney General Reno was ever advised that there was this new development before she made her decision? I don't know because I, I doubt it because it was not from, from our understanding of it and, uh, and the judgment was looking at what they were doing, maybe that she was not. I don't know, but there wasn't any reason to because it was not a serious plan. It was just another delaying tactic. The FBI testified before the House hearings that the negotiations had reached an impasse. They told the Attorney General they weren't coming out and that there was a stalling tactic and they weren't working on the seven seals. Their own negotiators had reached an agreement knowing that the first seal was finished and in order to get proof of it had sent in typewriter ribbons so that they could get that proof in their hands and yet the very next morning they launched the, the gas and tank attack. to the nostrils, to the eyes, to the skin. Just touching to the skin can be extremely painful. You can uh, have certain symptoms of nausea. Uh, you can have uh, certain symptoms of inflammation with regard to membranes. Uh, so it is extremely uncomfortable. Boot camp trainees are briefly exposed to a mild amount of CS for a few seconds. The Davidians received more than 10 times that dosage for more than six hours. 
CS isn't a gas, it's a chemical powder. At Waco, the CS powder was dissolved in methylene chloride, a volatile chemical used for stripping paint. Together, they formed an aerosol mist when sprayed through huge steel injectors fitted onto the tanks. In closed spaces, CS alone can cause unconsciousness, death, and can be ignited by a spark into a fireball. When CS burns, it produces hydrogen cyanide, the same gas used in prison gas chambers. Did you tell the attorney general that infants would not die or be harmed? I told her uh, there is no increased sensitivity to the effects of CS on infants, young adults, and older people. I believe that using CS gas against infants, against old people with respiratory problems, there were was, there was 60, 70 year old men in there, and there were young children. That's torture. And I can just see those kids barfing, vomiting, screaming, because you can't possibly have a gas mask that'll fit a little kid. Didn't their report say that gas masks don't fit on these babies? That's correct. And didn't they know that? They should have known that. explained to me that they were pouring fuel and that they were making Molotov cocktails to throw at the tanks. Now they never did throw Molotov cocktails at the tanks. The conversation about that takes place in the early morning hours, six and seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, the fire didn't start until right around noon. If you come out now, Shortly after they started, they began also not only spraying it from the CVs off of the booms, but they started firing ferret rounds on the excuse, of course, we learned later that uh, we were supposed to be firing at them. What did you feel? What were your emotions? Well, we definitely weren't believing what we were hearing over the loudspeakers, that they were not entering the building or this was not an attack. You know, we were told they weren't going to be shooting, and yet they're firing what amounted to mortars or, or rockets at us, uh, these ferret rounds, which sounded like a, a mortar. Were you, you afraid? Sh yes. Experts say the ferrets, or barricade-penetrating cartridges, that were used are non-pyrotechnic or non-incendiary. They introduce CS gas in a vapor form as the tip disintegrates. But experts also say the ferrets pack enough force to kill someone with a direct hit. Empty ferret boxes found on the compound grounds warn against firing the rounds at people. Despite that warning, agents fired ferrets into every window of the compound, and according to the review, any movement inside was targeted. With respect to the use of military weapons, these, uh, these pieces of equipment were unarmed, as I understand it, and were contracted. I mean, it was like a good rent-a-car. Uh, they were rent -a, a good rent-a-car, a tank going into a building. At nine o'clock. Attorney General Reno left the command center at FBI headquarters to give a speech in nearby Baltimore. From then on, Waco decisions were made by top officials of the FBI and the Clinton administration. Four minutes into the raid, it escalates. We, we, the the 48-hour plan, according to the testimony, is gone. We're now going to do a massive insertion of gas into every window. Did you consider staying in Washington, D.C., given that escalation four minutes into the plan? 
During the course of the morning, the question arose whether I should cancel the speech, and the FBI did not want me to do so because they thought it would attract attention if I suddenly canceled a speech that looked like there would be an emergency. One of the most inadequate parts of the Justice Department's report is their failure to describe the decision-making process at the command post. Uh, I, I think that is uh, uh, unpardoned. There is nothing in the investigation of what was going on in the Washington command post where they had a situation room which was supposedly constantly in touch with Waco. What were the communications that went on? What were the decisions made? And that we have never heard. Dozens and dozens of rounds have been fired at FBI agents. The FBI, in an effort to demonstrate its extraordinary restraint, has not returned fire thus far. Almost two miles above Mount Carmel, a surveillance plane was photographing events on the ground with a forward-looking infrared camera, commonly called by its acronym, FLIR. Edward Allard helped develop the FLIR. He's a former manager of the Defense Department's night vision laboratory and holds several patents on FLIR and night vision technology. Allard explains what happens as a tank approaches the rear of Mount Carmel around 11.16 a.m. That's the side the news cameras couldn't see. Thermal imagery is not the same as black and white imagery. Even though we're going to see uh, images that look like it's uh, black and white television cameras, it is not. This type of imagery is the same type of imagery that was used by our armed forces in the Desert Storm. The bright spots in this particular, this particular film are spots that are hot. The gray, spot, gray area are warm, we'll say, and the black areas are cool. They're relatively cool. They're, they're still pretty warm for a, a Texas midday, but they are a lot cooler than the rest of the surrounding area. If you look carefully, what you will see is the exhaust plume of the tank. You'll see the plume twice when the operator steps on the gas. There it is again. And now what you will see is a short burst there. That short burst, uh, we, we feel, is a, is a gunshot. The next view is a view in slow motion. As the vehicle approaches, we see the plume from the engine. And we have the gunshot now, freeze it there, please. You can see now the outline of the tank. You can clearly see the outline of the tank. There's the blade. There's the blade in front of the tank. There's the, the opposite side of the tank. This hot area back here is the, uh, the engine, the deck area. And uh, it appears that the, the shot that we're looking at is coming off the rear deck area of the tank. This particular one the burst lasted about one second. And we will see shots similar to this throughout the tape, and nothing else appears with the type of uh, thermal signature that we get of gunshots. Did the FBI fire one shot, even one shot at the division no, compound? Not. not throughout the entire standoff. standoff. What we're going to see here is a, uh, what could be called an infantry tank maneuver. We notice the tank, this is the tank smashing into the building. And we'll also see gunfire, multiple gunfire, on the outside of the tank to the rear of the tank. Right now we're seeing a close-up of exactly the same thing. The important thing to notice is the gunfire, multiple rounds being fired from at least two different positions. 
and it's about 10 births in approximately two to three seconds. And according to our calculations, uh, it indicates that both positions are firing automatic weapons. Uh, there is nothing in nature that would uh, duplicate these type of thermal signatures, uh, primarily because of the uh, short duration of the, uh, the bursts themselves. No nothing in nature could do that. And I'll remind the American people one more time that during that entire time, those six hours, and indeed those 51 days, the FBI never fired one shot at the Davidians. Uh, what we're going to see now is uh, uh, rapid fire in the courtyard right behind the dining room area. And you can see the, the fire going on, but it's difficult to see in real time. Now the slow motion shows things uh, much more clearly. There are two positions. We look at the tape carefully. There are two positions. And it apparently, by the signature itself of the of the burst, it apparently is going from this area here into the dining room area. What Allard saw was verified in an independent FLIR analysis done by Infrospection Institute for CBS 60 Minutes. Quote, it was obvious to me on several occasions that there was gunfire or automatic weapons discharge seemingly fired toward the building from the outer perimeter, end quote. A second letter from Infrospection Institute states the fear that kept 60 Minutes from informing the American people. Quote, Due to the potentially sensitive nature of this material and the resulting negative repercussions to introspection, we are choosing to decline any further comments surrounding this taped incident and our subsequent professional opinion regarding its viewing. End quote. In addition to noticing the gunfire, introspection saw something else. Quote, there were occasions on the video that seemed to appear as though people were entering, exiting, or being run over by an armored vehicle, end quote. The whole idea here was not to hurt people, right? That is correct. Okay, I want to focus on that building right there and on that corner. You see it's now structurally sound. Would you go to the next photo? We're now looking kind of from the front corner. These are taken from the airplanes. You will see that where he is pointing, that section of the building is gone. Uh, indeed, uh, a great portion of the building is gone. There was a discussion that uh, there may come a point in this where we would try to uh, poke holes in the building. Uh, my understanding... I understood that. Yes, sir. This I don't see as a hole. No, I understand that, yes, sir. Um, and I do not believe that there were any, any bodies found in that area. The closest bodies were found a little further in. Yes, Each one of those five bodies, it's reported, had extensive, according to the autopsy report, extensive body mutilation. Davidian Stephen Henry had a gunshot wound through his chest. His leg was sheared off at the hip. James Riddle had been shot too but a large circular portion of the right side of his chest had also been ripped out of his body. Riddle's red shirt was dangling from his wrist. His nearby coat had a red lining. This gunfire occurred at 11.24 a.m. About 10 minutes later, something got jammed near the tank's front wheel that caused the tread to come off. Something that was mostly red.
the available evidence indicates that could be James Riddle's body. To attach the disabled tank to a retriever and tow it away, men had to expose themselves to the gunfire FBI officials said was coming from the Davidians. This is one of these things, Mr. Chairman, that <coughs> nags at you. Damage to the tanks, common sense tells me, would be reflected in the, in the damage report. Almost two months ago, we requested it. Over two years have elapsed since this occurred. Surely the damage report had been compiled. I realize the wheels of bureaucracy turn awfully slowly in this town, but after two years... I'll be glad to look into it and see see what we can produce. As the gassing continued, the women and children went to the safest place left inside Mount Carmel, the kitchen storage room, a first floor steel reinforced concrete room, a former vault at the bottom of the square wooden tower. Women and children ended up going in there and because they didn't have gas masks and stuff, they were covering themselves with wet blankets and uh, wet towels and things like that. We knew that that, con that protection was in there. We believe we finally were able to make entry into that compound and we were able to insert gas inside that protective area. We actually drove right through the middle of the building into the kitchen area and basically at point blank range uh, fired gas into the concrete room where the women and children were in a, in a cul-de-sac like that where there was no ventilation. They must have been going through. There was only one door? Front, one yeah, entry. yeah. There was no windows, no, no back door or anything like that. We put massive gas in there. Their gas mass by that time had to be, had to be failing. They would be coughing, choking. They would probably be unconscious. Uh, some of them would probably be dead. Some would be basically inert. They may still be alive. They may still be breathing, but they're not going to be doing anything. In planning very large actions of this sort, like the going in at the building, you do a lot of planning like if this happens then this we'll do this and if this happens then we'll do this correct yes sir now didn't you consider or did you consider that fire might well occur in this instance and if it does we do this yes sir we did by noon mount carmel was a tinderbox a heavy layer of dried CS dust coated everything inside. Large amounts of kerosene and Coleman fuel from containers crushed by armored vehicles saturated the floor. Vapors from methylene chloride, kerosene, and Coleman gas filled the air. Huge holes ripped open by the tanks let the 25 mile per hour Waco wind blow completely through Mount Carmel. When the governmental agency made a decision to breach holes into the building, they set up a configuration 
of a pot-bellied stove. If you want it to burn slow, you close off the vents. If you want it to burn fast, you open it up. Well, they made a configuration in that building that was consistent to a pot-bellied stove. Any type of fire that would start, even if there was no CS gas, if there was no flammable liquids, there was nothing just but ordinary combustible materials. Once you have a fire incipient in a building like that, it's going to grow to a fast, rapid propagation because of the venting. At this front corner, a combat engineering vehicle has just made its last injection of CS. That small black dot is the nozzle tip, ice cold from the carbon dioxide propellant used to force the methylene chloride CS mixture into the building. Less than a minute later, the first of three separate fires that started in three separate locations within a three minute period began here on the second floor while the fresh mixture is at its most volatile as a fine mist. Once ignited, both the CS and the methylene chloride will become involved with the fire and add to the fire. Those sources will tend to produce a fireball or a flash fire. Two Branch Davidian survivors say they saw fireballs. Shortly after fresh CS was injected at this corner, the FLIR shows a second tank that's pulling away. As the corner comes into view, a fire is burning there. David Thibodeau said he was here and saw a fireball that ran the front length of Mount Carmel, possibly igniting another fire here in the kitchen dining room area, right next to the concrete room where the women and children had been gassed earlier. About a minute after the front fireball Thibodeau saw, another armored vehicle drives up to the rear of the crushed gymnasium and also pulls away. A few seconds later, survivor Derek Lovelock says a fireball raced from the rear of Mount Carmel to the front, igniting everything in its path. At this point, uh, the back of the gym was thoroughly destroyed, and it greatly disturbed me. At that point, I'd lost all hope. At 12 o'clock, someone yelled from the upstairs that there was a fire. The front, I could not get to the front because of what the tanks had come in, the stairwell that, I, that was closest to the front, so I went to the stairwell in the back. Because I'm thinking the kids, I'm thinking Serenity C. Jones, I was thinking of Isaiah and Joseph, some of these kids that I've come to know and love. I get up there, and there was a catwalk that was leading over the rafters of the church area. I walked to the front, I got to a blanket, I opened the blanket up, and a wall of flame shoots down the hallway in front of my face, down to the other end of the building. It was the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. I'm a drummer. And it was very, it was incredibly loud. I could not hear anything else other than this flame. Well, do you know personally how the fire started? No. The place is beginning to fill up with black smoke, and me and Scott were stood there by the stairs, and there was this kind of um, ball of fire with a, yeah, the tremendous heat, which caused us to jump back out of the way. And uh, it came from across, it came as if it came from the gym area across this way. It's believed the fireball Derek Lovelock said he saw started here with his flash. That flash was so bright that the operator of the FLIR thought it was so significant that he decided to fix his cursor in that area to uh, remind him or other people looking at the tape that there was a, uh, a very significant flash in the window. When we see it in slow motion and we see the flash, it appears to be a single flash, but it is not a single flash. It's actually a, two flashes. We got a primary flash and a secondary flash, and both of uh, these flashes uh, last about uh, one half second each. And they're, they're most likely uh, detonations inside the, uh, the building itself. Now, if some of you just saw this flash here, 
that is a momentary event. In my opinion, that's a reflection due to sunlight reflecting off some object in that debris. Sunlight reflections would show up as a flash on regular film which records light. But reflections don't generate enough heat, say specialists like Allard, to create a flash on infrared. Infrospection analysts noticed the same flash. Quote, a portion of the video showed a flash or pyrotechnic explosion in one portion of one of the buildings. End quote. The FBI made it clear from the beginning it used nothing that could have started a fire. Non-pyrotechnic delivery systems were utilized to insert CS gas. Pyrotechnic devices actually burn, and as they do, tear gas is dispersed. This pyrotechnic projectile is one of two found in the rubble of Mount Carmel. It's a 40 millimeter military device that's fired from a handheld grenade launcher. This one was found here, near the corner of Mount Carmel where the first fire started. The other was found here, in the kitchen dining room area. Twenty seconds after the two gymnasium flashes, still more automatic gunfire can be seen coming from the field to the left of the demolition tank. We counted the number of gun flashes, and in this particular case, we got uh, six flashes in one second, which indicates it's a rapid fire weapon of some kind. And uh, we also can see from the tapes that the fire is going in this direction uh, towards the, uh, the gymnasium where we saw the flash in the window. is when the fire, fire did start and the fire trucks did arrive, I didn't let them in. I held them at the crack point because I didn't want the firemen to drive into gunfire. I just wasn't going to permit it. I mean, it was a, it's a terrible thing and a very terrible decision to have to make. But I, I, didn't, I didn't hesitate. It, wasn't that, it, was, it took me that two seconds to make it. But it, we held the fire trucks. So that was our fire planning. Most of the remaining Davidians were concentrated here in the kitchen dining room area. It was their only way out except for one thing. Two men outside were firing machine guns at them. In the 51 days the FBI was involved, they did not fire a single shot. Uh, first, uh, that would mean quite certainly that uh, 27 of the people who died in the compound, I think the autopsy report showed 27, I may be off by one or two, um, who died of bullet wounds, those were self-inflicted or inflicted by other members within the compound. These are embers that are flying off the building, but you can see up in here, that this is rapid gunfire. When we analyzed the tape, we found out that there's, uh, there's two people there in this area here. And they're firing uh, for about 30 seconds in this area uh, right here where we have the burning 
dining room area. And uh, it's almost continuous gunfire. And towards the end of the, uh, the, the, this particular section, uh, we find out that the, uh, the people doing the shooting are actually uh, retreating away from the fire and shooting as they're retreating. The machine gunning of the Davidians trapped in the burning kitchen dining room was not only visible to congressional investigators, it was even visible to home viewers. So was the gunfire behind the tank smashing into the rear of the gymnasium. Neither was mentioned despite the fact the FLIR tape shown to the Joint Committee had far better clarity than the copy used in this film. You can see the flames real good from here. There came a point in my rolling on the floor and, and trying to protect myself from the heat and, and being in the pitch black, not able to see, that the voices of those behind me screaming kind of got through to me. I recognized who they were. Could identify the voices. It kind of galvanized me to just leap to my feet and jump or, or dive head first in the general direction of where I figured the hole was. When I stood up, the skin was rolling off my hands. My coat was all melted on my back and smoking. Now, I looked back over my shoulder and the hole had just come out with a mass of flames. And the first thought that came to me was, I'm the only one. I'd feel better if I could go and then go to Mount without him. They didn't want him to come out. They wanted to kill him. Fire was just going on and on. We realized nobody came out thinking maybe my husband didn't get out, but my children got out. A horrible, horrible way to die. I don't, I try not to think about it because I keep thinking at some point they felt all that heat. I kept thinking the people in the square, they were the ones who maybe they, they probably killed Cook to death. I think it was to be this tragedy to show what kind of a people we have as a government. As soon as the Branch Davidian Star David flag had fluttered to the ground, they ran the ATF flag up on that flagpole as a symbol of a military conquest because the whole world saw this as a symbol that the battle was over. Uh, I love this country. I love the flag. I love saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I still cry at the national anthem. I hope not only law enforcement, but I hope everyone does that. The FBI is not, as we've been labeled for the past two years, uh, anti-religious rights or anti-personal rights. We have plenty of freedoms in this country, which I love. We have the freedoms to stockpile weapons. I, I know I'm a Christian. I like practicing my Christian beliefs. I know I'm going to heaven when I die with my kids. Uh, I teach uh, in charge of the nursery, used to do Sunday school, youth group leader. If someone tries to stop me from doing that, obviously I'm going to be upset. But that does not give me the right to go kill someone, go to my house, using my children as shields, and say, I'm not coming out, I've broken the law, I'm not coming out until God tells me to. That is wrong. The hearings have been on for nine days or so. And I'm going to say this as nicely as I can, because some, a couple people have said, what can we learn from this? Uh, in nine days, I can't learn to be a legislator. In nine days, you all can't learn to be law enforcement officers. Byron, uh, Floyd Clark, uh, Jeff Jamar, Dick Rogers, like them or not, or like what we do for a living or not, they've been law enforcement officers, some of them, longer than I've been alive. And with that comes a lot of experience. What I'm saying is you have to trust the people in charge at the time. Uh, 
I'm low in the food chain, so I'm, not, I, I'm standing by what they did, because I, I do what I'm told as long as it's legal and moral. My God, torturing babies and saying it's part of their job and saying it's okay because their parents were bad. Our whole society is structured around the notion that if parents are bad, we protect the children even against the parents. In this case, the FBI and the government took the position, why, not only do we not protect the children, we use them as an instrument to try to get their parents to do something. We'll torture them so their parents will do right. Oh, my God, where did they think that up? We thought that their instincts, uh, the motherly instincts would, would take place and that they would want their children out of that environment. It appears they don't care that much about their children, which is unfortunate. The backward bowed corpse of this eight-year-old girl shows what cyanide does to the human body. It makes the muscles contract so violently that they can actually break bones. If one reviews the various uh, use of cyanide as a uh, method of uh, putting prisoners to death, you note that these people are strapped in their chairs very heavily. And that's not to prevent them from escaping the gas. That's to prevent the individuals watching the execution, observing the effects of cyanide has on the muscles of the uh, individual. Part of the evidence response team, I was one of the primary photographers that had to photograph the evidence before it was recovered and as it was being recovered and placed into the appropriate bags. I photographed the process, David Koresh's living quarters, and I also photographed all of the bodies from what is termed the bunker. Having been in the position to walk, touch, feel, hold, photograph, observe uh, a great majority of the bodies in, in, in Waco, I'm left with an overall disturbing um, kind of haunting opinion that many of the people in the residents were homicide victims. One of the FBI officials told Dr. Gurwani that they did not want us there because they wanted to do it themselves. The FBI lab was extremely uh, in a hurry to get the evidence from us and uh, it took us several weeks to go through literally thousands of rounds. Uh, and uh, all the bullets, uh, bullet cartridges, uh, fragments of grenades, uh, they were all turned over to the FBI lab. No independent examination of any of that evidence has been allowed, including the illegal firearms the FBI says were found in the rubble. Is that a weapon illegal that you found at the compound? This is an AK-47 type rifle that has been converted to permit full automatic Making fire. Making it illegal? Yes, sir. Thank you. I was panning the whole site, and one of the rangers came up behind me while I was still taping and hit me on the shoulder and said, you can't be doing that. And so I said, okay, that's fine, no problem. And then he asked for the tape. And I said, well, I'm shooting for Dr. Pirwani, and I'm not going to give you the tape until he says it's okay. Finally, we found Dr. Pirwani, talked to him, and he agreed that it was okay for me to give them the tape, so I did. They promised us that all they want to do is review it and they would give it back to us the next day. And they didn't. They told us that they had misplaced it. Uh, at one time they told us that I have it in my briefcase and I'll give it to you. Uh, uh, in fact, we said that we're going to delay giving you reports until you give a tape back. And of course, uh, they said, sure, we'll give you a tape back next time we come to your office. Uh, we, in fact, suggested we would go to Waco and collect the tape from them. Uh, and they said, no, it's San Antonio office. And um, 
And at one, at a certain point along this discussion, they finally said, the tape is lost. Uh, we can't give it to you. At this point, is there any doubt in your mind or the Justice Department's mind that the fire was set by the cult members? I have absolutely no doubt at all that the cult members set it based on all the information that has been furnished to me. The survivors that came out, their clothes smelled of accelerants. They smelled of, of uh, uh, diesel fuel. They smelled of lantern fuel. They smelled of, of lighter fluid. And then the laboratory later came back and confirmed uh, that they had done it. I would like to know why key information as to how some of this contamination occurred was omitted from the reports, specifically those survivors who ex exited the south side of the building. They had to walk through an area that was contaminated by fuel from large tanks spilled by the government tank operations. Uh, the thing that really concerns me is why the building was so totally destroyed afterwards, after the fire was, was out. There was no firefighting whatsoever attempted. And then the crime scene, and it was a crime scene, was totally, absolutely destroyed. And I've seen this happen before. Did you see the FBI changing the crime scene in any way? Yes, sir. As I, I'd uh, said earlier and didn't get to finish the answer, uh, they were moving the uh, vehicles, <clears throat> which uh, destroyed valuable trajectory evidence. And in the end, it turned out it wasn't, didn't matter because the but, but it didn't, it didn't seem to be standard opera operating procedure. You don't, you don't consider that standard operating procedure? Uh, certainly not in any crime scene I've ever been on, no. We were commissioned uh, early on in this as Deputy United States Marshals to carry a special commission so that we could prosecute federally anyone that lied to us. And we feel real comfortable, and Captain Burns does, that we were lied to. Let me be clear. This investigation has not uncovered any evidence of political corruption or influences. We have not found any of that. There was no conspiracy to kill Branch Davidians. The record of the Waco incident documents mistakes. What the record from Waco does not evidence, however, is any improper motive or intent on the part of law enforcement. David Koresh and the Davidians set fire to themselves and committed suicide. The government did not do that. That assertion to me that the media and that the government has made a kind of blanket declaration that the Branch Davidians uh, committed, quote, mass suicide, uh, to equate it to a Jonestown, uh, Guyana, um, suicide is the most irresponsible statement that can be attributed to anything having to do with the Waco incident. And, and I find it um, very offending to me and offensive to the memory of the Davidians and everyone else involved in this tragedy to uh, wrap it up in a nice, clean, well, it was just a mass suicide end of story because it was far from it. What the people believed that would happen is that God was going to judge either the world or them. If it judged the world, they would survive. If it judged them, they would promptly be in heaven. As one of them afterwards said, Livingstone Fagan, who lost a wife in the fire and his mother in the fire, he said, those of our people who died are highly honored in heaven. And so we should not worry about them. The thought was that the army of Babylon would kill them, as perhaps it ultimately did. The way things are supposed to happen in this country is when someone suspected of a crime, even if it's child abuse, even if it's capital murder, we give them a trial. A jury finds them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt before they go to sentencing. Then a jury or a judge sentences them and an appeals court makes sure the trial was conducted with due process. And then and only then do we kill them. We don't kill them first, like happened in Waco on April the 19th.